exciting uh, webinar. Uh, this month we're going to be talking about uh, choosing consoles and moving lights. And we're just going to give it a minute or two more uh, because we've still got people logging on. I uh, want to give them all a chance to uh, join us, uh, but we will be uh, getting things started in the next moment or two. Uh, for any of you during the course of the webinar that have any technical difficulties regarding uh, either audio or video, uh, the best solution, because it's really on the go to webinar end that, that uh, we might be having problems, is just to log off and log back on to the session. That seems to be the best solution. Uh, hopefully everybody's uh, able to hear me and uh, we'll get started in a moment. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started and uh, people can join us as we, uh, as we move along. Um, I noted from uh, taking a quick look at the attendees list that many of you have been with us uh, for past events, uh, so you're familiar with the format. Uh, for those of you who aren't, I'll, I'll do a brief run through on the, uh, the beginning so you'll know what to anticipate. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we're going to be covering how to choose consoles and moving lights, taking a look at some of the latest trends in the marketplace. Uh, for those of you who haven't attended in the past or would like to uh, see a repeat broadcast of this event, uh, the webinars are available at the Creative Stage Lighting website at creativestagelighting.com front, front slash podcast. And this includes all of the, uh, the previous webinars on uh, converging technologies, uh, LED, uh, and a couple of the ones that we did on uh, lighting design considerations. So we uh, welcome you to log on, participate in those. Uh, they're available both online and also as a download, so you can, uh, you can download them to your iPod and view them as a podcast. A couple of things before we get started uh, to give us a better idea of um, how to best meet your needs and, and address things. Uh, we'd like to go through a couple of quick polling questions for you. Uh, this is just gives us an idea of what your interests are uh, you, can, you can actually poll right online just to give us an idea of what the audience mix is. Uh, our first polling question is, what area are you most interested in? Are you looking at uh, lighting consoles and controls, moving lights? Uh, you're interested in information about static fixtures, source boards, leakos, etc. Uh, are you interested in LED lighting? Are you interested in other? Now, today's major focus, obviously, is going to be lighting consoles and moving lights, but your answers here will also help us to determine formats and content uh, for future events. Uh, so I'll give you a couple of, uh, a couple additional minutes to, uh, to cast your votes. Uh, we've got about 75% of you already cast your votes. Um, so we'll give you another second to do that, and then we'll get this uh, poll closed out, and uh, we'll give you some idea of what the, uh, the audience mix is like. Okay, so basically, um, the statistics are telling us that 54% of you are here uh, to find out more about lighting consoles and controls. 29% uh, of you are here uh, to, to hear more about moving lights. 4% uh, are interested in, in various types of static fixtures, 13% in LED, and 0% in other. So that gives us a, you know, an idea of... Um, both what your interests are here today and where to focus, and also where we want to go moving forward. Okay, um, second question we had for you is what type of organization are you a part of? Are you part of a touring or production company? Are you part of a theater, uh, a school, college, or university, or a church or house of worship? Uh, we should have probably had an other category in there, but I uh, feel this one's fairly representative. Give you another minute to go ahead and cast your votes here, and then we'll share the results with you on that. And 
want to thank everybody for participating. Uh, we're getting over a 90 uh, plus percent response ratio, so that's a it, you know it's a real good indicator for us. Uh, in terms of the actual audience mix, 51% uh, of you are part of touring or production companies. 21% uh, of you are um, part of a theater or a theater group, or that's where your primary interest is. 18% uh, in school, colleges, and universities, and 12% in um, church or house of worship. Okay, and our last question for you is, what's your current role in your organization? Are you a lighting designer, lighting technician? Uh, are you the, the purchasing or decision maker? Uh, or are you the, the ultimate end user? So in the case of a church, that could be the person who has to come in on, uh, on Sunday to start the lighting, um, the lighting show before services, uh, the person responsible for, uh, for running the light show at the, at the school, somebody other than, say, the lighting designer or the technician. Okay, on that one we got, actually got a 94% ratio, and 71% of you are lighting designers, 56% lighting technicians, 55% the, the purchaser or the decision maker, and 37% the end user. So that gives us a, a you know, pretty good idea of the mix. Obviously there's some crossover in there, uh, but we, we appreciate your participation. Okay, so we'll go ahead and we'll get started with the, uh, with the rest of our, uh, our webinar. Let me give you a little bit of an idea of, of who today's presenters are. Um, Michael Levitt is actually a member of the Creative Stage Lighting family. Uh, he came on board as a, uh, a product manager for high-end technologies, um, lighting consoles, moving lights, wireless technologies, things of that nature. Uh, Michael has his, uh, his master's degree in fine arts from UCLA. Uh, he's also uh, done extensive design and automated lighting program uh, programming for things like uh, The Grinch, Batman and Robin, uh, The Flintstones in uh, Viva Rock, uh, Rock Vegas, and um, Miss Congeniality. In addition, on live events, he's done things like the, uh, the Salt Lake Olympics, uh, the Super Bowl Halftime uh, half Show, and the Ryder Cup. And Michael also brings product management experience from his time at Martin, where he was the product manager for the um, Martin Maxis and uh, Max Media Media servers. Uh, so, uh, you know, broad, broad background there, uh, brings extensive knowledge and, and uh, hopefully a lot of good input into uh, today's content. Um, our guest speaker today is Joel Young. Uh, Michael describes him as, uh, as an old guy with a lot of shows under his belt. Uh, his credits are, are numerous. He's worked as a designer and a programmer for one of uh, many of the biggest names in the concert touring business. Uh, just a couple of the artists that uh, Joel has worked with include uh, Justin Timberlake, uh, Christina Ag Aguilera, a uh, recent pro uh, project with Lionel Richie, uh, and Joel has a degree in theater design from the University of Arizona. So we'd like to uh, welcome both Michael and Joel and thank them for being here with us today. Okay, so. Some topics that we're going to spotlight today include what does your production require? Uh, taking a little bit, bit of a look at the venue itself, uh, you know, what are you looking to accomplish and, and what kind of considerations should you be planning for? Uh, planning for future growth, uh, you know, as, as we're moving forward and technology is advancing, how do we make sure we're making the right type of purchasing and or rental decisions? Uh, to, to support the, the venue or the event that we're, we're involved with. Um, networking your venue or production. A lot of tech, you know, technology considerations going on there. We'll address that. And also green or not green. Uh, you know, the whole LED versus conventional lighting controversy. So that's enough for me hogging uh, all the discussion. A uh, couple of the quick questions that we want you to ask yourself as we go into this is, what, what is your production or venue? Are you working in a theater, in-house concert, uh, concert touring, house of worship, club, DJ, things of that nature? What's your budget? Uh, it's something that a lot of times we're surprised that people haven't asked themselves uh, because it's going to be a major consideration in the type of fixtures um, and desks and things that are going to be affordable to you. What's your experience level? Uh, you know. Are you uh, an industry professional or are you somebody who's volunteering your time? Again, it makes a decision in the choices that we make. And how often do you have the budget to replace the lighting system? You know, with technology turning over so rapidly, 
You want to make sure that you're making smart decisions today that are going to meet your needs going into the future. So that being said, the first point that we're going to start talking about is lighting consoles. And we'll talk a little bit about the types of control consoles that are out there. Uh, basically, we've got uh, preset boards. Uh, you know, many of you may be working with these in existing venues. Uh, memory consoles, uh, preferable in productions where the scenes don't change, such as a theater production. Uh, moving light controllers, uh, capable of controlling both conventional luminaires with dimmers, as well as providing controls for intelligent lights. Uh, you know, this seems to be more and more the direction that everything is moving. Uh, PC-based controllers uh, allows you to run uh, software off your PC. Uh, gives you a lot of the feature sets that a full-blown console um, offers without a lot of the expense. Uh, and then also, you know, the advent of remote focus units, uh, the ability to pro program on a desk, but then control that desk remotely via an iPod or another form of PDA. So what we'd like to do now is, is get some discussion going, uh, turn this over to, to Michael and, and um, Joel, and get some feedback on, you know, what they see as the role of the console in, uh, in theater. So Michael, Joel, Again, thank you for joining us, and why don't you go ahead and, and talk a little bit about this point. Okay, thanks a lot, Kevin. It's, it's uh, really exciting to be doing this and getting, you know, a lot of discussion going on topics that I see all the time when we're out. I'm always running into uh, people who are not sure what to get. They don't, they maybe have heard of this product or that product, but and they end up not getting what really their needs are, or they spend too much money on things they don't need. And actually, that's the most common thing I see, especially in schools and churches, is they end up spending money on features that, that they're never going to really take advantage of. So you've got a super nice console with all kinds of features, but you have no moving lights because your budget only allowed for a console. So I, I want to address some of that. Uh, Kevin, if you could back up a couple of slides to the questions to ask yourself. Uh, I'd like to, when thinking of controllers, talk about those uh, topics a little bit. There you go. Um, and I'll let Joel chime in here. Uh, but what's your production and venue? Uh, well, I mean, this is an obvious question, as which a lot of these are. Um, but, you know, you really need to know what you're trying to achieve, both with a controller and moving lights. If you're in a theater... We all know you have certain applications. Perhaps it's a single cueless uh, programming situation, or uh, maybe you're in a concert venue. There's several types of concert venues. You could be in a touring house where you know there's different acts coming in and out all the time. Um, but you could be in a concert venue that you run your system all the time. So each one of these have a different kind of requirement. House of worship. A lot, a lot of house of worships are now putting in moving light controllers and automated lights. And uh, what are you going to do with that? I mean, are you a conservative kind of church where you're going to just basically light the stage and white light and so forth? Or are you a more progressive church where you're going to do essentially a rock concert every Sunday? It just depends. And then then there's the uh, nightclub situation. You know, what are you going to, if you have a nightclub, what you need there? both with controls and so forth. And then all the way down, you know, on the DJ level as well, what are you trying to achieve there? So uh, each venue and production has its own requirements. And then, of course, some of these could be hybrid. You could be a house of worship like the church I belong to. We have uh, three or four times a year uh, named concerts come through, and they don't tour with their own system, so we're using our in-house system and adding in additional lighting to supplement the system. So, you know, the needs are different there. I mean, for example, you want to have room in your console to bring in a dozen or two dozen lights for a specific event, plug them in, and be able to program with them. So if you're, you chose a board that's too small, that perhaps it works for your church, but doesn't work for this additional expansion, then you're, you're going to run into trouble. Uh, so it's, you know, you really got to think about what your needs are, what your realistic needs are. I'm afraid in this business we tend, a lot of us tend to be, you know, tech geeks, and I'll probably fall into that category, so I can say it. And we want the cool new features, but sometimes you've got to sacrifice the cool features and, you know, put your money elsewhere. Well, part of the, part of the advantage 
of all the console lines that exist now is that there's multiple um, versions of the same desk. So essentially running the same software, but much bigger or smaller hardware interfaces. And that can save you a lot of cost. So if you're in a smaller, if you're in a smaller venue that, that you're not going to, you don't need a, a vector red with all, with three touch screens and two or three external touch screens and 20 faders, and you can use a smaller version of that console, it can save you a considerable amount of money. Uh, and still be usable when you have to expand for temporary purposes. If you have a concert come in or something, it still has the capability to control that many fixtures. It's not as quick to get around because you have less direct access interface, but it still gives you the, the potential for that, and that's often a good option for, for many of these venues. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, if you're, let's say, you're any size venue, a theater, you also don't have to account for every possible situation that may arise because especially if you're in a decent sized city where there's a rental house around, you can, you know, if, if you're using a system that's tiered system, um, you know, like a Grand to make where there's an ultralight and a light or, or whatever, you can get the smaller desk and then if you do do that big concert, go rent a desk for a weekend. You know, it's a lot cheaper and, you know, I understand that sometimes it's hard you know, to get the money to do that, because a lot of venues will put up the capital, but when you say, oh, I want to go rent a bigger desk for the weekend, there's, there's no money for that. So, of course, you've got to take that in consideration. But, but again, you know, because of these tier console systems, even if the budget doesn't allow it, you're still not in trouble. You can still do what you need to do on the smaller version of the console, it's just not as convenient. Yeah, and, and absolutely, it, the best advantage to that sort of tiered system would be that you know how to run the platform. So now you can run the platform all the way from a PC version all the way up to the big guys. I think that the one thing that, that I'd advise or have people really look out for is that when you're choosing a console for, for your venue, if you're a venue that just is going to do conventional lights, is never going to have movers, then, then getting a, you know, a memory console, an ETC or something is fine. But, but I really firmly believe that if there's any chance or at any time you're likely to be using moving lights, that you really need to have a console that's designed to run moving lights. Because though many of these consoles can run moving lights on them, like ETCs and stuff, it doesn't do it in a way that really is going to allow you to take advantage of what your light can do, because it's so complicated to do. So that would be the one thing I would say to really be aware of when you're choosing your console. Don't get a conventional-based console if you think there's any chance that you're going to be running moving lights in the future, because I think you find yourself very limited. All right, let's move on to the point, what's your budget? I mean, uh, you know, obviously, this is always a consideration. Um, actually, just stay on that slide for things, Kevin. Um, you know, the budget is going to dictate what you're doing, but let's use your budget in the most logical way possible. And, and I was speaking to Joel before we came on. One of the things I see over and over again is people installing gear, equipment that really they're not going to make use of. And, you know, net, complicated networking things, wireless remote systems, really nifty stuff, and then you have two moving lights because you don't have any more budget. So, I mean, I think the important thing here is to balance your budget. Don't get a board that's the console that's out of the wor of this world of features and, and can control 32 universes of moving lights when you've got four moving lights, and you're, n you're not going to be able to get any more for the next five years. And uh, that's the other thing to consider we'll talk about here in a second, is how long is this console going to be in your venue? And where are you going to be as, as a theater, a church, a, a concert venue, whatever, in that five-year or replacement period? Uh, uh, an advantage with consoles today as well is with all the touchscreen interface that everybody uses, uh, when the software has to expand for, for new requirements and new needs as, as our technology develops, it's really easy for these consoles to upgrade and be able to control that. Unlike the older desks that were very hardware oriented, you know, you just, if the button didn't exist, you couldn't make it do anything more than that. I, again, why oftentimes getting a moving light style desk um, with touchscreen interface is better than getting a traditional uh, memory desk, ETC or whatever. Um, in your venue, because it, it does give you room to expand software-wise without having to worry about not having enough hardware interface to deal with it. Yeah, I mean, uh, I can't emphasize enough the point of balancing out your system with the budget you have to spend. And, you know, sometimes that means 
you know, going and fighting the consultants or the other people that are dictating what's going in because, you know, um, and I better tread lightly on this topic here not to offend any consultants and so forth, but, um, you know, you can't, um, you can go and you can, a lot of times you can say, look, we don't need this complicated networking system in here with 27 nodes throughout our theater when we have four lights. You know, that stuff's expensive. Running wire and Cat5 cable and copper around your theater is expensive stuff. And, uh, you know, keep try to, if you're involved in that process at the beginning, you know, analyze what your needs are going to be in the next three to five years or, or a little longer if it has to be and say, this is what I'm going to need. I mean, it is impossible to know in 10 years where we're going to be networking-wise and computer-wise. So the way I kind of look at it is don't even bother because whatever you're putting in now is going to be obsolete in 10 years, and that's not a bad thing necessarily because the technology will be so far advanced beyond you. If you're still messing around with, you know, um, DMX in 10 years, you've probably got an archaic system. Uh, the other thing is, is experience level. Who's going to be running this console is a major, major factor in what uh, their experience and ability are to actually drive this system. Um, and the prime example, of course, is this, is the house of worship. You know, if you're going to have uh, volunteers running the, the service every Sunday like we do at my church, uh, then you need to keep it, you know, relatively simple for them or you're they're just you're going to either have a complicated control system with very um, non-sophisticated programming in it because they couldn't figure it out or you're going to have uh, a mess when when you're running the service because the queues are lights are flying everywhere because they couldn't figure out how to mark anything and they're going to the wrong colors and and they're panicking because they don't really know how to do it uh, so my experience with that situation, and you know, this applies to clubs sometimes too, because the people programming are often, they'll put in a bunch of looks and the DJ will actually run it on a touch panel or whatever. So you really need to adjust according to who is your ultimate person that's going to be running this thing. And then we talked about a little bit how often there's a budget to replace the lighting system. I mean, you really try to analyze, and that's not always easy in a school or place where you're, you're depending on capital improvements and stuff, but um, I'm sure if you went to the administration of your school with talk of what is, you know, the life of this product and when are we going to be able to replace it and stuff like that, they're going to think, well, this guy's really on the ball because he's thinking ahead and where, where we're at not just trying to get every cent they can right now. Most of these consoles have a pretty long lifespan now. Uh, I mean, if you think about it, uh, you know, I did a gig a couple months ago on a Hawk 2, and that desk is 15 years old or something. That wasn't necessarily a pleasant experience, having come down from all these newer consoles, but, you know, it's still there, and they're still getting rented. So if you're – certainly the expandability of the consoles – that are available now is going to really help you offset some of that concern as you're looking at the, the growth of your, your venue. Uh, so, yeah, so I mean that's, that's the important factors that I think you want to look at when you're deciding a control system. I mean, what point Joel makes about the, the hog is true. I mean, you may have to use this thing for 15 years. So you want to make a good choice now. Uh, and, and all this being said, you're probably some of you are thinking, yeah, but in 15 years, I want to have a hundred moving lights. Well, yes and no. You got to weigh that battle, and no one can answer that except you analyzing your own application. Uh, systems now tend to be a lot of them are starting to be Windows based, and that's a big advantage in, in the R and D side because you can port the software from one platform to the other. When the Hog came out, well, the reason that when they went to the Hog three, they couldn't just port the software to a new processor like you can on the Windows system. So you have to basically start with the first line of code again and rewrite the code. So it made it a lot harder to go from an upgraded system. Now with Windows, like the vector that we deal with, they just upgraded all the vectors to dual core system. It runs the same software. It's just on a dual core Windows processor. 
All okay, right, so Kevin, I think, do we have any questions on any of this that came in? Well, actually some of the questions are more related to moving lights, so what I've asked them, I've answered a couple of those offline, but I've also asked them to remind us when we get to that section of the presentation. Um, I, is, are there any questions anybody has out there based on the material that Michael and um, Joel have already covered? And again, you have that, that uh, ask question feature there that you can type in your questions and we'll be glad to respond to them as we go along. Uh, Michael, you want me to jump ahead here again, back up to um, where we yeah, were talking well, about the... Let me just add one thing in here. Uh, sure. Everybody that's getting involved with, with moving lights or light, moving light consoles now is very lucky because, you know, back when we started, it, you know, you had very limited options. You, you know, if you were doing very lights, it was on a very light. If you were doing uh, Morpheus lights, it was on their desk. If you had... had um, the lights from LSD, you were on an icon, and the only thing that really controlled everything or, or DMX-based lights was the HOG2, so you really had to fold your programming mind into how these desks work. But now we have a lot of options, and, and all of them have a different logic stream on how they program. And so as, as designers that may have to run desks or as programmers and technicians, we're really fortunate in that we can hunt around and find the console that, that works best for how we like to work. So I, I think that when you make a choice about a console, if you're going to be the primary user for, for any amount of time, that, you know, that's certainly something you want to look at. You want to look and see how the logic works for, your, for how you look. Of course, you, you have to be willing to, uh, to alter your programming stream based on you know, new feature sets and stuff. You don't want to limit yourself by what you know. You want to be able to grow into you know, the new features that these, that these developers are offering you. But, but certainly we have options now about you know, what console works best for us. Right. Now, I do have, uh, I have a question which, which I addressed, but I wanted to throw out to you guys as well. Uh, Sean had a question. Um, based on the comments that you were making, do, does, does that mean we should get two consoles if we're mostly using conventionals, but occasionally using movers? Uh, you know, my response to that is that there's uh, so many consoles on the market that easily handle both uh, that you're probably looking more at, you know, what, what console best meets your needs but does address both conventionals as well as movers, but I'd like to see your guys' opinion on that as well. The reality is, and, and I'm a firm believer of this, and the Ava Light guys will get really mad at me for this, but, but I firmly believe that you, you know, it's not a problem for a moving light console to turn dimmers on and off and, and delay their times in and out. I mean, it's very simple for us to control conventional lights. Not a problem at all. Easy, easy, easy. But I, I don't think that the most efficient way to control moving lights is off a desk that was primarily designed as a desk to control dimmers. And and the, and the able like guys will get on my my case about that, but but I, I don't think Sean that that's a concern at all. I think any moving light desk out there easily controls conventional lights on and off, not a problem at all. Well, and you know what, both, Joel and I are both. I think you consider old guys in programmer business. I mean, neither one of us are nearing retirement, unfortunately, but. We've been around from pretty much the early days of, of programming. And both of us come from a theater background yeah. where what we controlled was ETCs and these other consoles. Right. And, and I've done, you know, I've done tons of theater-type Broadway shows and tours and stuff. And, you know, a lot of the old school people are still using a conventional desk for uh, programming the conventionals and a moving like desk for the movers. That's going by the wayside mostly. And one big reason is, is because cost of operators. You cannot, I mean, even even in the early days, they started MIDIing them together and matching the cue list because you couldn't afford two union, you know, stagehands to push go buttons on a tour. Uh, but um, so it's pretty much gone. You will see it occasionally. I would never recommend it in a permit venue like a church or even a school. Look, the, the, the world of professional world is programming on one desk now. So if you're a theater school and you're teaching that they should use you to two desk, then I, and you know maybe I'll get some hate mail from professors for saying this, but you're not you're doing your students a disservice because that's not what's happening in reality. And with multi-user networking now, you can if if there's so many conventionals and so many moving lights that it requires you know, you, one person can't program it all. Well, that easily can get around with multi-user programming. Now, you take, you know, three grand MAs or three copyright vectors or, uh, you know, I guess ETCs will do, do that too. But uh, 
and you program them separately, you're all operating on the same database of information, you take the, uh, the two other ones away and you play it back on one. So I don't see any reason in this day and age to really go with the conventional moving light thing. Okay. Um, Samantha has a question um, regarding consoles. With so many choices on the market today, uh, what do you see to be uh, the next uh, moving light console for tours and corporate events? You know, is there, and I, I guess this is more a question in terms of the overall trends that you see, the directions that consoles are heading. Um, you know, what do you see that's leading that, that, uh, that charge? I, I'm going to let Joel answer that because I work for <laughs> I work for Creative and I'm the product manager for the CompuLight line, so I don't think I can objectively answer that. But he doesn't work for Creative. Okay. Well, I mean, clearly, right now the the, the market leader is Grand MA, and they've got their new Grand MA two that's coming out, and it's a you know great big, huge, and beautiful desk. I I think that that the trend that we're going to see in the future. You know, when you look at the Grand MA2 that's selling for fifty-five or sixty thousand dollars, that is a huge capital expense. It is absolutely monstrous, and and even the smaller desks, you know, it's a big capital expense. And and a couple of manufacturers are starting to go to with all with every developer having a PC version of their desk now. You can get Maxis PC, you can get Compulite, uh Vector PC, you can get Grand MA PC, you can get Hot Three PC, you can get everybody. Everybody has a PC version. But I think that what we're going to see is is a trend towards a hardware interface that's dumb and just connects via USB to whatever computer you want to put that PC version on. Because in the end, you know, it's a computer. And, 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 and going to that version means that instead of spending, you know, 30000 on a console and you've got this big, huge hardware thing that you can't upgrade as easily in terms of the hardware aspect of it, you have a two or $3,000 rack mount computer that in four years you can just replace with another two or $3,000 computer if you need to. And that the hardware interface is always the same. Um, again, you know, we can hook our touch screens to that computer as well. So you can hook two or two, three touch screens or however many drivers you have available to that computer. So you have plenty of touch screen access and the hardware is, is interchangeable to whatever. I guess what Joel's saying is what I, I would refer to as a modular type system. Correct. And, and I think that that pretty much applies to perhaps everywhere but your, your real hardcore concert touring world where you need the big desk with lots of faders and you don't want to be setting up 45 different pieces of a, of a system every day to get going. So you want one big desk, you don't care how much it weighs because you got union state hands that are going to flop it out there for you. So, um, but in a theater, in a house of worship, even the clubs, uh, in those kind of corporate applications, you know, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And the cost is considerably less because, and as you said, it's expandable. It's uh, it's replaceable. If you start out with a PC version and then you add an editor wing and then you add a playback wing later, you know you can add more playback wings. Right. If you decide you need 30 faders for this particular show, you can have two more fader modules and plug them in. And I think the developers are taking note on this too. I mean, Compulite world, essentially the machine is a Windows XP program running on a computer, and all the user interface is is equivalent to a keyboard, basically, plugged into the desk. Now, we, we use Ethernet, but, you know, the editors want human interface device, which is, you know, and, and the playbacks is another one. So, you know, it's really just a PC application, and those are done for multiple reasons, and uh, development costs are very fast that way. Like I said earlier, you can port it from one platform easily. Now, and Michael's right, you know, when you're programming a big show and you have a lot of lights and, and you've you got a turret time frame, you got all those things, having a lot of of touch screens available, a lot of view spaces available is very important. So, you know, that that certainly is a, something to take into consideration if you're doing really big shows. Um, but I think that, you know, everybody's, I think a lot of people are going to start shifting to PC versions for cost and, and convenience. Yeah, and you know, I often say to people, everybody wants the biggest, coolest of everything, and you know, I, I'm the same. Um, but how many, what percentage of shows are, you know, the Joel Young shows of the world, where you doing these big concert tours, or Peter Morris, or Steve Cohen, or one of those guys, Roy Bennett, where you have 300 moving lights, and you need this massive multi-network for consoles for programming. 5% maybe? 10%? Maybe. I mean, most of the boards in the world are in theaters, are in churches, are in clubs, are in concert school. venues, schools. I mean, 
So it, that's, we focus on that end of the business because it's cool and it's written up in the magazine, but it's the small percentage of the actual users that are programmed. Any other questions, or should we press on? So, so we weren't trying to dodge like who we think is going to be the winner. <laughs> no, no I, I think it's a good discussion, and we're getting a lot of uh, feedback and comments coming back. I, I am getting some uh, personal preference kind of questions, and I don't know if we want to get into a lot of that. Uh, specific comments about things like the ETC EOS or the the full bore. Um, we're we're trying to, you know, I think stay fairly broad. Give you, you know. We're not giving you necessarily personal opinions on a con on a console of preference. Although, as Michael said, we do have some some things that we might have some vested interests in based on the, the things that we've worked with. Um, but any any comments at all that you'd want to contribute on, say the e the ETC EOS? Uh, I you know what I don't I I decided when we were putting this together that it didn't want to go in that direction. Yeah. You know, I don't want every console has good features about it. The EOS. The Ion and those theatrical strand, they, they're great consoles. It all, in my opinion, depends on your application. If you're doing mostly conventional stuff and you occasionally throw on a few, move, few moving lights, it's very logical to go with a conventional style desk that runs moving lights. If you're doing a lot of moving lights, then maybe something like a Hog or a Grandma or whatever is, is a better solution. Jan's Vista, very good user interface. Um, but I don't really want to get down to that because it's that's your what we're trying to show here is it's not really about what the name or the manufacturer because they're all good desks they all do a lot they're mostly all dependable I mean I can't think of anything that on the market right now that I would say oh don't buy because you know it's a piece of junk or anything you got to determine what you're trying to do and whether you feel comfortable with it. And hey, if you feel good, we're running an EOS, and that's your baby, and you get to know everything about it, and you can drive the desk, more power to you. I'm never going to argue with that. I've got my own personal preferences. But, you know, the, the argument on what console manufacturer, I think the best place for that is Light Network. They, <laughs> they love to have that argument. But I'll network. go back to what I said before, and I think the important thing to remember when you're making this choice, and of course everybody has the console they like. But I think the important thing is that is that you have the choice. The, a big deciding factor is going to be how the console works for you in terms of the logic of your program. You know, the, the workflow of how you like your spaces set up and stuff. That is going to be look. They all control all the moving lights out there, and they all have effects engines, and they can all do multi-part timing. They can do all of that stuff. Everybody can do. That's no different. The only thing that differentiates the consoles, I think, fundamentally as a programmer, is is how you do that is how you access that information, how you set up those screens, and how that workflow is the quickest for you to make you look the best you possibly can. So, so versus giving you a specific desk I think is good or bad, I'll just say find the one that, that, works, that works the best for you. I don't, and I agree with Mike, I don't think there's any desk out there that I would say is a bad desk that I would just say run away from, run away from. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I know from dealing with it on our side, it's, it's really a personal preference thing. I mean, you know, I can get people who argue the, the benefits of the Grand MA, uh, and I'll have somebody that will argue the same benefits for a, a Hog 3 uh, or, or an AVO. I mean, it's, it's what they grew up using, uh, what they're most comfortable with, and what they felt meet their needs best, because, you know, certain desks, you know, may be a little bit more targeted towards certain types of venues. So, you know. And you, here's the thing. You have a lot as a programmer. If you're making your living full-time as a programmer, you have a huge vested interest in one particular desk. It's it's your baby. You you it takes hours and hours and hours to learn a console fully. Once you do that, you want that thing to stick around. You want jobs on that thing. You're out there promoting it. So you have a huge vested interest. Even if you don't own a particular console, it's 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 your baby. You've got to uh, you've got to market that around because you're trying to get work for it. I mean myself. I run shows in theatrical style, I would say. I mean, you don't, you would never call me as a programmer if you were going to do uh, The Grateful Dead, Totally on the Fly, busking all the time. You could uh, call me for that. Yeah, Joel, Joel would be better. I, I'm more of a, you know, a precision kind of person. I like every theater shows, uh, concerts that are done in that style where everything's marked and you don't see lights move when you should and things like that. I prefer, I prefer that. 
that Cuba style as well, especially the touring LD, because I, I don't, I'm not really concerned about looking cool each night, moving a lot of faders if I don't have to. I'd rather hit go and have it be exactly the same. Okay, so let's let's press on, and we can pick up some questions at the end if we have time. Sure. When do you where do you want me to press on to? Because I'm not sure where you where you want to jump to from well, here. We're gonna talk. We'll talk about you know tell you what we'll do quickly. Just in a few sentences, talk about I think the role of a console in each of these areas. Right. With yep. And oh. and and what I'll do is I'll try to field the questions on the fly as they come in. Uh, any ones that I feel are particularly appropriate to what you're talking about. Uh, you know, I may I may jump in there a little bit, but anyway, um, why don't you go ahead and, and start from here and just tell me as you want to advance. Okay, so I think uh, obviously most theater productions, and some are musicals, and some are you know, I want to tell you a rock concert type show in a theater, but but generally I think it's we're safe to say that theater productions are single cueless type shows. Um, so you know that that style of the show, I'm going to give you a, a good example that I give on why you might want to use a more moving light style desk if you've got a lot of moving lights. Uh, in a theater board, you do a lot of looping, you do a lot of copying and pasting and cut, you know, you do a chase, it's something you will copy that ten times throughout your show. Whereas on a moving light multi fader style desk, you might be able to just, with a macro, trigger that same chase over and over again, save yourself some programming. So, uh, obviously we're dealing with single cue list type consoles, so ones that are totally on the fly and don't have a single cue list, obviously I think are inappropriate for theater. The other thing about theater shows is you gotta look at what kind of show you're doing. If you're doing a bus and truck where you're going into different venues every day and you've got you know and you've got moving lights you have to refocus, you know, then then having a, a console with you know presets built that where the cues are stored with a reference to the preset versus a hard value is certainly going to make your programming time each day much, much quicker. So go ahead and advance. We'll slip through these pretty quickly here. Um, okay, so now we're in touring. In touring, I, I'll let you hand, handle that. I, I, I don't even know how to address the role of a console in touring. The bigger, the better, the more outputs as possible, <laughs> the faster to program. I mean, you know, the, con the concert touring is so broad from I, Robert Plant and Allison Krauss that I did last year. We had something like 40 movers and 20 or 30, you know, maybe 40 conventionals and, and you know, two trucks of gear and you know, the big Britney was 19 semis with, with 400, 500 moving lights. So, you know, that's a really broad range of shows. And, but clearly, you know, concert touring is primarily moving lights now. Um, smaller shows use park hands and stuff, or they use them as backup or, or washes. But, you know, the, the biggest full-featured console or the, the most full-featured console that you can get that you're comfortable with is, is certainly going to be the, the thing you're going to want to use on that. Because you're going to, most concert touring, you have lots of effects, lots of multiple chases running. Um, lots of hooey going on. Well, and I think when you get into the concert, you start wanting to look at desks that's capable of doing networking, multiple multi-user programming, so you can have multiple desks for programming. Uh, same as would be said for big scale TV shows. Um, and then net distributing your uh, e your your data, DMX, over Ethernet, be it ArtNet or whatever protocol you're using, or someday if ACN really takes hold. I mean, that starts being important because you're creating your own system right there. Plus, it has to be durable and flexible and easy to pack into a truck every night. So that's the other thing that you wouldn't want. That's why I was saying earlier, I don't think you want the modular, six different modules, and be unpacking those every day. But maybe. I think it's just in how you package the modules. Yeah. You pack them in a way that you don't have to that's physically true. set them each up each day, and you're just running a hot right, right. and putting it in. All right, so move, moving along, Kim. Okay, House of Worship. Next slide, House of Worship. I think this falls pretty much into theater. I mean, I, I do a lot of this type of work. Um, you know, it's very similar most of the times to a theater, but then again, there's there's concerts involved. Like, as I said before, my church, we bring in, you know, uh, Mercy Me or whoever. They perform on our stage, and then we supplement the system with a few more lights. So... Uh, in those cases, I'll come in, or one of these staff guys will come in and program the show, or their LD will come in and stand over his shoulders and give me the blue wash, give me this, give me that. So you need a little bit more flexibility, I guess, depending on your venue. Some venues maybe aren't so progressive that are going to do that, and you know maybe a straight conventional desk will work better. 
The other thing I found in House of Worship that is good to consider is most of the bigger ones now have multiple venues. Like ours, we've got a main sanctuary, but we also have two separate rooms with both moving light systems, one for the teenage ministry and one for the middle school ministry. So they all have both have small boards. And having a compatible system across the, the way so that you can move gear between uh, venues and the, once you train one volunteer, they can go into the other room and run it as well is a good thing. So it's good to have like a main console in one and then maybe a PC version and a wing in your other. All right, next slide. Uh, schools. I mean, you know, that pretty much goes in with the theater, I think. Uh, you know, I think the important thing in schools is, A, you want to consider what's being used out, outside of the school, what people need to know. Uh, you know, you don't want to use something that's so obscure that no one's ever going to see it. But, you know, you don't want to also lock your people in. My, my thing, I, th I like flexing. I like the opposite of what I just said about houses of worship. I like to have one type of board in one venue and another totally different board in, in another venue. So if your theater has a main auditorium and a black box, I, I'd li I like to see like an ETC in the, you know, or strand in the main one and a hog two or a hog three or whatever in the black box. So the kids get a mixture of, of what they're learning as well. And I think that tied in with this but sort of related, I'm a big fan of the pre-visualization things like the WYSIWYG systems or ESP or whatever. A lot of these companies, they all seem to do it. They've got um, uh, networking systems. I know I, I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to sell ETC here. I mean, uh, WYSIWYG, but WYSIWYG has a WYSILAB system, I don't think what they call it, where you can buy 10 licenses for nothing, practically, to get you to use it. And then you can actually cook them to the moving lights, I'm um, sorry, the conventional, and you can program a 40 moving light show virtually without having any lights. I think everybody tries to just get some lights. It's very difficult to learn a desk with four lights. Yeah. Yeah, right. one, of the, one of the things that I, you know, I agree with you, Michael, as far as education is concerned, I mean, I think you know, it's one thing to actually be running the show you know, in the auditorium, but the other job that, that's always going on in the school is preparing the students to move forward with that technology. And you know, the things that might be more, say, traditional in education are not probably the same desks that they're going to find out in a touring environment or a corporate events environment or other types of venues. So I think by a school having multiple types of desks, they're giving them the opportunity to uh, learn on a broader platform. Um, and the other nice thing that, you know, we, we see a lot of vendors now who are coming out with a range of desks so that that affordability factor in education, which always, you know, we're, Everybody's much more conscious of budget today, obviously, but particularly in an education environment, we find that you know we're always working with them within budget constraints. And the fact that there are now a broader range of desks that are you know meeting that kind of need, uh, I think speaks well for you know having some diversity there, giving them the opportunity to learn on different platforms. Okay. Um, uh, you want to move on to the, the next one there? Slide. Yep. Uh, yep. TV studios, or I'm sorry, clubs. I think that uh, you know, clubs it is a unique situation because a lot of times you're just you're you're linking up to music, so audio triggers, MIDI, those kind of things become important on the console. Uh, clubs aren't really my forte, but um, you know, there, there's a lot of lights moving around and stuff, so effects engines and stuff like that, multiple faders. I think I'm much clubs, less concerned about. Yeah. Independent fade delay times and you know cue structure, or and touch screen things. buttons, so lots you know? of buttons that are easily exactly. quickly accessible for you know with definitely okay. okay. A lot of TV studios. Um, Joel, I'll let you do. I, I haven't done much. In, I've not, done nothing in TV studios. All right. TV well, shows, but no TV I, I've done you know quite a few, and and uh, it's very much like a theater. There's usually a single cue list kind of system. And you know, bringing up a lot of channels and stuff like that. TV studios like theaters. Some of the accessories become important, like tracking backups if you're doing a live show, or you know, rack-mounted backups, wireless remote focus units, so you can go out on the 
on the stage area. So common in TV studios, and you don't have this in theater. You all, theater and concert, you always have a nice clean shot of the stage. TV, you're usually stuck behind some wall somewhere, and if you're lucky, they'll give you a monitor so you can actually see the stage. I, I got to agree with Michael. Remote focus units you know, can be really important. I did uh, the VMAs, and I think it was 2004, and it was the first one they did in the arena, and they had four stages, one in each corner of the floor, and we were tucked up in the corner, so I was behind one stage and to the side of two others and was looking at the front of one, but it was all the way across the arena. So the ability to take my remote and walk around the arena floor and walk over to the 40-foot high Chihuly glass piece and stand next to the lights as I was focusing was really, really handy and probably would have made that job insanely more difficult not having the remote. Work. And when you're doing focus, when you're doing aerial focuses and stuff in a concert environment, but your console is not on center, it's very difficult if you're over to the side. You really you know, need to be over in the center. And if you're not fortunate enough to get to the slide over there during programming, Remote focuses where you can do your, your preset focuses can be real handy. And remote focuses that go into something else. Just talking about remote focus now, you know, doing outdoor shows in uh, like sheds in the summer. I mean, you can't see anything. So be able to walk around the stage and stand in your band positions and do the focus without having to have somebody tell you to tilt it up or tilt it down is awesome. All right. Um, let's move on to the first deciding uh, which control console. We've talked about these a little bit. Um, you know what we talked about this at the beginning. Look, what's your what's your show require? What are you going to do? You're going to do a single keyless show. You do a rock concert. You have a lot of effects moving around. You're going to bust the whole time, or you're going to do a mixture of two. Nobody can answer that except the person this, you know who's working in the venue themselves, and write a list of what am I going to do? Okay, so I'm going to you know do a single keyless system, and I'm never going to do anything on the fly. Then that will pair out to other considerations and things you need or don't need in the control. Uh, how many dimmers, moving lights, and LEDs are controlled? Well, this is a practical application. You know, if, you, if you're buying a console capable of 32 universes and you have four lights, you don't really need that power. But if you've got a console that's not as four universes and will never expand beyond four, you know, that could, you've got to make sure you know that you're not going to need more than four universes. And today, four universes of DMX can get eaten up so fast with LEDs. Yeah, it really, yeah, it eats up with them. And the other thing is, you know, you've got to look at how many direct DMX outputs does the desk have? Are you, are you in a venue where you're going to be doing direct DMX? Or are you going to be doing ArtNet? You know, so, so that doesn't matter because your ArtNet out of your desk, you can control the universes you want. Um, that's certainly a consideration because there's some desks that only have two or four outputs, and some that have eight direct DMX outputs. So. Yeah, and you know, to me, that it's I think it's always nice to have a few DMX outputs on the back. You just plug an XLR in, but a lot of desks now have expansion through ArtNet or their own protocols, which is really nice. So that way, you get a four universe desk. But if it's capable of sixteen universes, later on you could buy some rack mounted boxes, which generally. Uh, you know, have four universes each or eight universes each on them, and you can expand it that way. And, you know, earlier I was talking about networking and whether you need it. Do you really need, you don't necessarily need all this Cat5 installed in Conduit and everything. You know, you can run a piece of Cat5 later if you need it. So, uh, and I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to bring in the ramifications of local codes and things like that where things are supposed to be. But generally, I think you want to consider, um, you know, do you want to network it now? Maybe you run a couple of Cat5 lines up to your catwalks or backstage so that later on you could plug in a box. But that doesn't mean you need to buy the box now or the node now necessarily. It just depends on your application. And the other one is really important topic going forward. Uh, you're going to be controlling media servers and LED pixel mapping. Is that where is where you can eat up universes like their water? So uh, media servers, we all know, is the, in the LEDs. It's pretty latest, greatest type of stuff, and you know some consoles manage them better than others. Well, and some of them require many, many more. The Maxis Maxedia, you know, you you patch that in in phases. So you patch a main control that's 28 or 32 channels, and then if you need layer control you patch layer control, and if you're going to do key stunning, you patch that, so that's expandable. But then you go to, I, I'm thinking it's the HIPPO, but I can't remember, 
that requires like it has like two thousand control channels. So it requires like four four DMX universes just to control that media server. So you know, right away you're gonna have one of those, and I'm pretty sure it's the the, the hippo, but I'm not after sure. But you know, so it makes a big difference. I don't know how much Catalyst requires, but it's a significant number. So you got to start thinking about that. How many media servers? I mean, that, and LEDs, like Michael said, they'll you it just kill you. The other thing about LEDs when you start thinking about your consoles is that if you're going to be running an effect across LEDs and you're going to take your your color blaze and you're going to run it as a 12 cell unit, well, you know, if you have 30 of those, that's 360 lights that that board is thinking about controlling because though it's one six foot strip, it's 12 fixtures in terms of control. And once you start running effects, you're you're running insane numbers of effects across lights, and it will bog your system down, absolutely. That's a, that's a great point, because people always think, I'm just going to run it in the biggest mode I can, so I can have the most control. Well, there's a problem with that. If you don't need it, you don't necessarily always need to do it. Joel and I are working on a show right now. We're using some Martin stage bars, and I said, put them in the simple mode, because I we're lighting a, a wall with them. I don't need them you know, one stage bar could be, what, 30-something channels, 36 yeah. channels. I said, make it six channels. That's still a lot of channels. But the board doesn't have to process all that information and regenerate it all the time. And it, it will bog down boards if you if you overload them that way. And just because somebody says it'll do 32 universes, the question you ask is, well, is that 32 universes of effects fading over every channel all at one time? And they'll usually go, uh, uh, uh no. maybe not. Because that's a big difference, 32 universes of moving lights, where half of the parameters aren't changing because they're control or, re, you know, whatever. And though Michael will probably hate the thing, is, this goes back to my point about where I think that the future consoles is going to be, you know, a, a hardware interface that's dumb that connects to a computer. Because the more of these things that we have to control, the faster our processors need to be. And, and the ability to expand that by simply replacing... You know, the motherboard in a in a rack mounted PC uh, is is huge. I mean, just that Lionel Richie we had. I want to say 40, 36, or 40 sun strips, which are 10 cells a piece. So there were you know 300 lights there with the desk. I mean, it was 30 lights or whatever it was to us, but it was 300 to the desk. And then we had color blaze, and we had pixel line 110s, and you know, once you and and forget about the moving lights. I mean, we had 60 moving lights, but we had 500 channels of control with the with the LEDs and the and the uh, conventional lights, and that didn't even count the media server. Well, and, and the point here is is that know your your products. These LED products all have a huge amount of modes that they can run in. Study those modes. Decide what you want to achieve, and don't just always default to the widest possible number. But don't, but the point of this is that. If you think you're using LEDs and media servers in your venue, then you need to take into account the potential needs of that. Which moves us into this slide that Kevin's got up here, which is networking. One of the great things about media servers and LED pixel mapping and other things is the, the movement to ArtNet or you know, RDM, ACM, because now all of a sudden you don't have to run you know, eight lines of DMX. You can do this over one, one wire. But, Keep in mind that you know just because it's an Ethernet-based protocol, it's not unlimited necessarily the amount of data you can send over. And every device works a little differently in, in how it handles that data and bi-directional communication and stuff. Okay, so um, we talked about this point already. We're going to skip through this. Um, and on the moving lights, we, we took quite a bit of time with the consoles, but I thought we would talk a little bit more in depth with those because the viewers seem to be 70% like of them were more interested in that. So we'll finish up here with moving lights, uh, but it won't, we won't spend quite as much time on it. Uh, Kevin, you want to just go over the types of moving lights there on your next slide? Yep, sure. So, uh, you know, again, we're, we're looking at, again, basing it on your needs. So what we, the, the marketplace is full of options out there. You know, basically you're looking at moving head spots. You've got 250s, 575s. 700s and 1200s with a wide variety of vendors to choose from. So again, it's choosing what's right for your venue, and we'll touch a base on that a little bit, and also field any questions you might have there. Same thing on the on the, the moving head wash light side of things. Uh, same type of selection, same general vendors there. 
Uh, one of the areas that we see the marketplace making some significant changes right now is in LED moving heads. Uh, we're seeing a variety of vendors, including uh, JB Lighting and Verilite and Elation and others, uh, coming out with, uh, with LED moving head washers and probably in the not too distant future we're, you know, we're going to be seeing that followed up by um, the, the LED spot once the technology gets us to that point. Uh, so, you know, again, it's a matter of looking at your venue, looking at, you know, what you're looking to accomplish and what kind of budgets you're working with, and then selecting the appropriate fixture based on that. So, again, now we're back into looking at the role of moving lights in the different types of venues. Now, one of the, one of the things that came up as a question when we were talking about consoles, and I just wanted to throw it out because theater is a, an appropriate place to address this, uh, one of the one of the um, the attendees was talking a little bit about the uh, the noise of moving lights, particularly in venues like theater, corporate events, things like that, where there tends to be a very low noise level. Things can easily be heard. Um, I don't know if you just want to touch on that briefly in terms of your observations there, particularly in theater. Well, I'll I'll take that because actually that was about the first thing that was going to come out of my mouth in noise sensitive situations. Now, I will say that I think we've came light years from when I started in this business, which every moving light when I started made so much noise you couldn't even put it in a theater unless it was a really loud musical. I mean, some lights are better suited. I mean, not necessarily wash or spot, but some manufacturers have put more emphasis on the low noise. Almost every moving light now has a studio mode, they'll call it, or uh, uh, a silent mode or whatever. What those modes tend to do, and you have to be careful with those modes, but what they tend to do, instead of running the fan at full all the time, which you what you do in a concert because you don't really care, they the software will ramp up the fan or ramp it down or there'll be temperature sensors in there that will turn on the fans more when it needs to cool but then turn them down less or it'll just run them in less. Um, you know, so you really need to do your research if noise is important most manufacturers who develop low noise fixtures publicize it a lot because that, that's a selling point for them. The one I can think off the top of my head is like a TW1 from Martin. It's great light. It's very quiet. It's a 3200, uh, 3200K source. And uh, it, though it has fans on it, it's not very loud at all. Uh, obviously, things like VO5s are inherently you know, lights that have a, a heat sink on the back tend to have very little fans, if, if no fans at all. Uh, LEDs, a lot of them are low noise, too. I mean, the JB Lighting A7, which you had a little picture of there, it does have a fan on it, but low noise for sure. Now, the misconception about LEDs is a lot of people, oh, they don't put out any heat. That's not really true. LEDs actually can put out quite a bit of heat. So they still need heat management, uh, but you know, it probably takes less fans to cool it down than it would a uh, discharge lamp. Uh, but generally for theater, uh, depending on your theater application, noise is the most important. Um, space sometimes is important, you know, how much room you have on that batten between that drop flying in and that sort of stuff. Especially on Broadway, if you go on a Broadway show and you look up, you'd be amazed how much stuff they can fit in a tiny little space. I think that, you know, there's other concerns, considerations as well. I mean, the type of venue that you're in in a theater. If you're in a black box with a 14-foot trim, then you probably don't need a Mac 3 profile that's 120 pounds and, you know, is three and a half feet long from, from head to tail. Um, you also don't need the output of that. You know, a 500 or a 700, a 575 or a 700 watt light is probably going to give you all the output you'll need at that process. But you'd be surprised how many Mac 3s, Shoguns, and all these things you see in a corporate event or, or a theater where... The, the actors are practically bumping their heads on these yeah. things. It boggles my mind. I'm like, you could have, and then you dim it down to 50%. Yeah. So, but, uh, you know, so that's pretty much the, the most important thing is on theater is, you know, know your trim. You, you almost always know what your trim is going to be right away in the theater. It doesn't tend to vary unless you're touring. But even then, it doesn't vary nearly as much as concerts. So you can be pretty bold on getting the smaller lights that can do your trick. And of course, I, my personal preference as a designer is color mixing. I, I, I would probably, I never, 
use a non-color mixing light in the theater production unless I absolutely can't get anything. The, else. the other thing, as a, as a straight, just between LED type fixtures and and uh, discharge fixtures or anything that isn't an LED fixture, is that uh, you know LEDs right now are nothing I would ever use as a front light. Um, if you want to light faces, it's not the right choice because you really just can't control the colors and the and, and that aspect well enough yet. Um, I'm sure at some point in the future it'll get there, but I still think you want to go to, you know, the conventional fixtures or the color mixing, um, yeah, subtractive I, I color mixing use, light. Yeah, I don't even use discharge lamps as front. I might use a TW1. Yeah. I usually use a 3200 source or something to that regard. So, But for as far as touring is concerned, well, you know, what can you say? The sky's pretty much the limit. Uh, there's every light out there. A lot of times it doesn't matter how big. I mean, Joe, I know a lot of shows. Joe works as synchro lights are used, and, yeah. and now shell guns are out there. These these lights are huge, but if you're hanging them at 40 feet in an arena, it really doesn't matter how big they are. Right. Or how loud they are. Or, yeah. you know. and, and, you know, you get so many options in touring now. I mean, on Lionel, the last tour I did, we had Mac 2K profiles, Mac 2K washes, uh, Comar Infinities, Mac 700 uh, spots. Um, Studio Command 1200, Pixel Lines, uh, Color Blaze, some conventional lights, or big lights, um, sun strips. I mean, you know, so you really get a lot of options. You know, you pick it, it's all about picking a light that's right for the application uh, that you want to use it for, really. And you know what? That brings me back to theater and some of these other topics. That's great in touring because you've got a lot of lights, you've got a lot of space, you can control it. So you choose multiple types of lights, each for a specific application. In theater and houses of worship and so forth, you don't often have that. You need something that's more so flexible. Yeah. Right. And if you have volunteers running, if you have six different types of lights, it's a lot more difficult to program Absolutely. than if there's two different. There's a spotlight and a wash light. Now if you've got three of each, you've got three different sets of gobos. You've got all these different features that confuse people. So. Uh, you really got to consider that application. In concert, that's the easiest one. You, you need a light for one gag in the show, you hang it up there. All right, Kevin, we go back, go on to the next slide if you want. Sure. House of Worship, I was just saying, I mean, again, lighting there, uh, you've got to consider front light and back light. I mean, most automated lights are more backlight fixtures. When I came to my, uh, my church, they had all the moving lights in the front and had not a single light from the back or overhead. And it was on video. And then nothing against the guys there. You know, that was the way the consultant designed the system to be, and they had never changed it. So we moved all the moving lights to the back, and we lit in prior front, and we put like a half CTB, color correction blue, on there so that we could, uh, so when we dimmed it down, it didn't warm up too much, and, and it looks, looks great. Also, in Houses of Worship, I, I, I suspect that, you, that once the lights are up there, they tend not to get rehung. Whereas in a theater situation or an educational theater situation, you know, every show you're going to pull that stuff down, you're going to put it in a new place for the next show. So I think when you're thinking about Houses of Worship, you really, really need to think about, uh, I mean, LEDs are going to be very valuable for that in places for lighting walls or backlighting spaces where you're not going to have to be up there changing the lamp on it, you know, hardly ever, or if ever. Right, and LEDs, another great thing about LEDs is they tend to be a lot less power consumption. Yeah. So something that you're going to have, and a lot of times in, in churches, the venues used a lot, so they're on a lot. So you don't need, you don't have the bulb replacement, you don't eat up nearly as much power, and a lot of times you're limited, especially if you go out of this, this church that we're looking at in the photo, well, that's huge. But that, I don't know where that is, but there's probably a smaller venue uh, down the hall where the kids go or whatever. And in those, LEDs are great choices. But also, I think, especially in places like House of Worship, where you, again, where you have limited volunteers, or volunteers of limited experience and, and access to the, the equipment, that if you're specking equipment for that venue, do a lot of research on dependability, because you might want to make a sacrifice in some feature sets for a light that you know is going to work all the time. I mean, I can't tell you how many clubs and stuff I go through where half the lights don't work anymore. There's a pile of broken lights in the back because nobody there knows how to fix them. And so they got a light and it ran for, you know, two months or three months and then it quit working and nobody knows how to fix it. So, you know, really seriously look at the dependability of fixtures and, and how they're holding up 
uh, when you make a decision about that, because you might want to sacrifice some some features for a light that you know is going to run. One of my clients I work for is Feld Entertainment. They do all the Disney Live, Disney on Ice, and, and Ringling Brothers. And um, you know these shows go out on the, the road for two years. I mean, you send a well, an ice show goes out for three or four, five, six years. But a circus goes out for two years, and these things get hammered. You know, nine, ten, twelve shows a week, moving every week. And and their big concern, the designers that design for Feld don't get to pick the equipment manufacturer. The Feld people pick the equipment manufacturer. The designers can just place the lights in the rig because their primary concern, their biggest deal, is dependability. They need those lights to work every day, and they need the lowest maintenance cost and the lowest maintenance time that they can possibly get. So, yeah, and then that's a good point. I mean, concert tours, you know, upstaging or or epic productions. I mean. They employ the, the best of the best technicians, pay pretty well, and you know if, if you've got all these crazy amounts of lights, they can afford to stock crazy amounts of parts and be back there all day fixing lights. But that gear comes down every night and goes up as well. So okay. when, when a light breaks during the show, the guys write down the numbers, and when the rig's going up the next day, they just put a spare in place, and they never have to, you know, they don't ever send the broken light back up. Right, and in, in a church, for example, a lot of times it's a cattle. There's yeah. no fly system at all. So if you've got to replace a light, you're hauling it up on a rope or you're lugging it up a spiral staircase or something. So, Joel, I couldn't agree more. Dependability is huge. So you might, even though the new light that just came out this week is cool, you might consider waiting, uh, you know, until that light's proven a little bit before you put it in your venue. So, um, but anyway, we'll move on to the next one there, Kevin. All righty. Schools, yep. you know, a lot of those things we just talked about are the same. The big difference is there you tend to have fly systems and you can switch them out, but maintenance is a real issue because what I've found in a lot of schools is the maintenance budget isn't what it should be. That They buy the gear with the capital and then when it breaks, you know, you know, moving light circuit boards can be quite expensive. You know, a moving light lamp can be $200 as opposed to a source four bulb, you know. so. Uh, you know, that's that's an important factor, and I would say if you're considering putting moving lights in your school or your church or whatever, you know, make sure, go fight for a maintenance budget, So because these things will break. It doesn't mean they're not dependable, but when you mix heat with electronics and motors moving around and smoke and, and dust, and so yeah, it, they're, they're going to break, and you need to be able to fix them, or you just wasted your time. Um, another thing that can be really useful in, in universities and churches is, is other products that merge with, with conventionals, like sea changers, cell doors. You know, I mean, scrollers are kind of going by the way, sort of, but hey, so scrollers are cheap and they, they still give you 12 different colors in front of a gel, I mean, in front of a light. So you know, it doesn't always have to be a Mac 2K. It could be, you know, uh, a sea changer or something like that inside the light that allows you to color mix. A picture that I actually like a lot, um, and I use it, I don't get to use it very often because my applications generally don't allow me to, but I think the uh, color command from high end was a great little picture for for uh, based, fundamentally being a, you know, a conventional 3200K source with a color mix on front of it. And it was a nice punchy kind of par beam and you could mix any color you wanted. I, that was a great picture for theater kind of venues. If I had a, like a local com lighting company, like a little regional lighting company, I'd add a whole bunch of those. To you know, you send instead of sending out a 120 par can rig, you send out a 40 or 60 studio command rig, and you got every color you can choose. And it doesn't matter when designers come in what they want because you just that's the color you put in. Well, and as a programmer, I love being able to cross fade from one color to the Absolutely. other and not have to mix it. One other point I'll make on the on the theater in the schools is uh, something I ran across a lot, uh, is people think that uh, I'm a university, so I have to use something like a VL1000 or a Source 4 Revolution. You know, and, and I'm not slagging those products, good products, but you don't have to do anything. There's no rules because you're a theater that you have to use a conventional theater desk no more than there's a rule that you can't use a Mac 250 if you want. Now, I wouldn't use a non-color mixing fixture, but as a, I was helping a school that I went to uh, look at buying some moving lights, and they were like, well, we're doing conventional stuff, so we need lights that project gobos and is a 3200 source, 
and just this refocusable special. I'm like, okay, well, what happens when you know this the the music event comes in your venue in the weekends? Well, I don't care about that because I'm in the theater. Yeah, but the school does because they're buying this equipment. Or what if you do a musical? You know, what if you're doing Guys and Dolls and you want you want some flashy flashy lights? You know. So it's not just always, well, this is for theater and this isn't. Again, it's your application, where you think you're going to use, and what you want to teach your students to use. Clubs, I mean, you know, it's all over the place. Small is usually better. Small and fast. And I would say dependability is a huge thing in clubs. As Joel pointed out, I've been in so many clubs where you look up and a third of the lights don't work because lights are supposed to be cleaned on a regular basis. They're not. Or clubs are the worst. They're smoky. There's hazer residue. It's, and lights have fans in them, so they suck all this hazer residue in there, and it clogs everything up and causes them to either have very low output or break. So, you know, lights like uh, what Mark came out with, the Smart Mac, for example, which I don't know much about, but it's a clever idea. It doesn't have any fans. It doesn't suck in any smoke. It's, it's duty cycle, it's no duty cycle, so it can run all the time, and the maintenance interval is like three times what other lights are. Because, let's face it, they're not going to maintain them. So, and, and in a club, you're not trying to light anything specific. You're not trying to light faces so people can see faces on stage, or, or you're just trying to do effects to make it a fun place to be or an interesting dance floor to be in. And, you know, if you have a guy that's running them and can do cues with them, that's great. But fundamentally, it's an effect light. Its purpose is not to light things. It's to be a light. And, you know, it's a shame the thing that's kind of went by the wayside in the last five years, the mirrored light. I absolutely agree. I think somebody's going to come out with a real nice 1,200 or 2,000 watt mirrored light. I've had a every manufacturer around. ask me, what is the one light out there that you don't have that you want us to make? And I tell every single one of them I want a new mirrored light with all the features and the output of the new yoke lights and all the speed of the old mirror light. I mean, like, not just mirror speed, but color changing speed and double snap speed. I mean, uh, the mirror lights, when they're in their heyday, like telescans and cyber lights, they had a lot, you could pack a lot into that, a lot more than the moving head. So you've got a lot of features in those lights. Um, but fast. The thing I liked about them was the speed. I mean, you could take that, you know, beam at, you know, in a rock application, you know, we have a Billy Joel cue during pressure where the, all these mirrored lights, boom, pop in the audience and, and so fast, you know, swept down to the stage. That it, was just this, it was just a wonderful effect. And you can't even come close to that with the yoke light. Anymore. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of small, you know, the smaller manufacturers, Elation, Martin, uh, you know, Chave, and some American DJ and stuff, they have a lot of mirrored lights. And, you know, if you're doing clubs, of course, cost is probably an issue, but, you know, always got to weigh costs with, dependability in your lifespan. And sometimes clubs don't care. The owner is going to build this club. He's going to sell it next week. So, you know, it doesn't care. But it's definitely consideration. I see Kevin's moving us along here. We're running out of time. <laughs> yeah, we're getting a couple of people that are saying they, they need to, to move along. So I just wanted to make sure we, uh, we cover as much as we can before people have to leave us here. Um, well, I think, we're, I think we're about it here. This is sort of our last main thing here. Let's just run through this real quick. I, Knowing your client is hugely important. Who is your boss? Who is going to get you your paycheck? Who's going to hire you on the next job? Might be Billy Joel, or it might be his manager. It might be the director, or artistic director of the theater. It might be the head pastor. You've got to please these people. You know, for example, back to my church. If our pastor is very progressive and he lets us use smoke and he lets us flash the lights during the worship, but other people wouldn't do that. So you definitely don't want to lose your job because you went you went over the line. Knowing your audience, you know, if you're doing a show with a bunch of senior citizens, you probably don't want to point all the lights in the audience and start strobing them at them if you want to keep your job. So, you know, who's your audience and what are they there to see in your venue? Um, you know, what type of show? We already covered this. Uh, you know, single cue list, you're going to bust it or whatever. Video is an important thing. IMAG, image magnification. Churches are, you know, of course have this. A lot of concerts have it. Now, are you going to do, uh, you're going to have the artist head up there at 20 feet wide. And if you are, you need to learn a little bit about lighting those people for video. And because it's hugely important. That maybe will be an entire different uh, webinar later on, on doing that. It's too much to go into here. And then your stage area. 
at the end of the day, one way or the other, you have to illuminate the stage, and that's important. So whether it be a combination of conventionals or moving lights or all conventionals with a few moving lights, you've got to wash the stage with light, preferably they can be color changing, and then you overlay it generally with hard edge lights that you do specials and pools and effects and gobos, and then you can either do aerial effects and smoke, or you can do ground effects. That's something we really didn't talk about. If you're going to have haze in the air, it's a whole different proposition than if you're not allowed to have any haze. Because with haze, you can do aerial uh, looks and create different patterns in the air. If you're, you're in a church, for example, or theater where you can't have any haze, you know, a lot of movement panning around, it's all you're going to see is the dots on the floor panning around. Joe, any comments on any of those for me? No, not really. Okay. I think you're right, you know, knowing your client, I mean, Robert and Allison that we did last year, you know, they don't like moving lights, they don't like spotlights, so we had Lico's focused all over the stage and all the places that they would be, and the moving lights only moved once, it wasn't as big a deal, but we also were very limited on truck space and size, so we used VL3000 um, wash lights as the backlight, and 10 of them would wash the stage from side to side in whatever color you wanted, just so bright, it was wonderful, it really gives a lot of power, so... Because we weren't concerned about how many sources we had, we just wanted to make sure we had coverage. Well, Joel hit on something there to sort of, for me, to wrap it up. And, you know, all of this, the important thing to you is you're obviously interested in this stuff because you logged on today. You want to become a person that's an answer person, that can evaluate the situation and choose the right thing. Because generally, the people putting up the money have no idea. They're depending on you or a team of your people to come up with the right way to spend the money. And, you know, if you're a prima donna who says, I've got to have a showgun in my church because, you know, Peter Morris used them on the last tour and they're cool, you know, that can tend to be a problem. You really need to balance everything. The best way to be, to be patted on the back by your boss, whoever that is, is to use the money that they have efficiently and stretch the most dollar out of it. And that includes where these lights are going to be in five years. So dependability, you know, uh, things like that. That's why that's so important because if you're going to be around this venue, and even if you don't, I would hope you would care what happens to the venue down the road. Um, you know, that's, you want to be somebody who's uh, going to be viewed as somebody who made the right decisions, who evaluated it, and just didn't pick up a, a copy of Lighting Sound America and go, hey, that's advertised here, so it must be cool. All right, I will wrap it up. I don't know if Joel wants any final comments, and we'll let Kevin sort of do his last bit. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Okay. Well, um, I, I don't know if there's any last-minute questions. I think we fielded most everybody's. Uh, a couple of things I just wanted to, um, to mention, uh, you know, as is the consistent theme of these webinars, uh, one of the things that we want to use these as is an educational vehicle for you and to keep making you aware of the resources that are available out there for you. So, you know, if you look at opportunities for uh, advancing your knowledge, uh, check out the PLSN bookshelf. Uh, there's tons of books out there uh, regarding stage lighting, consoles, rigging, uh, pretty much whatever you're looking for. There's a book out there that's going to address it. Uh, and Amazon.com and PLSN Bookshelf are great places to, to take a look for those resources. Uh, there's a lot of stuff on the web. You know, obviously on our site, creativestagelighting.com, we have the podcast site so that all of our previous um, webinars are recorded there and available for you for download. Uh, we've also got informational videos there. We've got links out to uh, YouTube. Uh, we've got our own Facebook site, so there's a lot of information there for you. Uh, but then there's a lot, of, a lot of additional resources like the Light Network, Control Booth, uh, iSquint, uh, Richard Cadena's site, Swami Candela, uh, and then, uh, of course, all the major trade magazines like PLSN and Live Design and Lighting and Sound America. So we definitely encourage you to you know, continue to utilize those. Um, and to and to network with your with your counterparts in the industry because there's a you know there's a lot of good opportunity for networking. Uh, so just in in a quick summary, again some of the primary considerations you're looking at regardless of the venue you're talking about is what's your budget, both current and future. Uh, what are your actual needs in regards to a control or a moving light? You know, and as Michael said, don't get caught up in the 
the me too type of thing of you know using things because everybody else is using them or because they're the latest and greatest. Take a look at what your needs really are and evaluate you know what what it is that's going to best meet those. Um, as Michael mentioned, what does your client expect? You know, make sure that you understand who your customer is, whether that's the, uh, the pastor of your church or it's the, uh, the lighting designer that you're programming the, the show for. Make sure that you're aware of what they're looking to accomplish so that you can help meet those needs. Uh, you know, and again, uh, not to say that um, there, there, aren't, there are things out there that meet every need, but there's a lot of things out there that are definitely overkill for a lot of applications. So, you know, keep in mind what, what are the items that you really need and what's the best utilization of the budget that you do have. So that being said, we want to thank you all for attending. Um, we ask you to, you know, check out the CSL website frequently for upcoming events. We are anticipating, you know, continuing this series. Um, in, we don't have one yet planned for June, but we are definitely looking at ones for July and August. Uh, we'll keep you updated via email. Um, and also, if you have a few moments after the fact, you'll be getting a, uh, a seminar follow-up. We'd appreciate if you could uh, follow up with that for us because uh, it gives us a great indication, you know, feedback on this event, plus also some, some input in terms of where you'd like to see future events going. Okay? So that being said, we thank you for showing up today. We thank Michael and, and um, Joel for their time today and uh, for the excellent job they did in presenting. And we look forward to seeing you all again at future events. Okay? Thanks very much and have a great day.